We have a much better understanding, but still a very incomplete understanding of the complexities of the complex adaptive ecosystems in which we're embedded as a species, and of the even more complex, in the sense of uncertainty, socioeconomic systems that we've created on a global scale. And that's the challenge. That's what global governance has to get its head around. And on the level that I've just described it, it's an impossible task. So you've got to be able to reduce it to a level where you can begin to contemplate how you might address these particular challenges. Because in the abstract, described as I've just described, they are beyond human endeavor. And unfortunately, we cannot, unlike the digital cloud, be connected together, wired together in such ways that our collective human intelligence is somehow capable of extraordinary insights that individual intelligences are not capable of. I do not mean to say there is no wisdom in crowds. There is some wisdom in crowds under certain circumstances. But you can't wire human brains together to create an enormously complex management system. What we're therefore seeing as a result of this level of complexity, which is exacerbated by the fact that there has been a fundamental structural shift in the balance of geoeconomic power and derivatively geopolitical power in the world. Kishori is perfectly correct. Everyone who knows the history of the world knows that this 1820 number is the classic number that is always mentioned where, for the first time, Asia did not have more than 50% of global GDP. And the reason, of course, was the early stages of the Western Industrial Revolution, which transformed the balance and which has provided, as it were, the engine room for the last uh, 190 years. But the underlying truth of it is that at that point, the world was not tremendously tightly connected. So as a consequence of that, none of those multiplicative effects that we were talking about just a few minutes ago applied in the 15th century or in the 17th century or in the 18th century or in the 19th century. They are very much a function of the period of history through which we are now living, and we do not have the instruments to be able to address them successfully. So our core challenges is that we have global institutions which have no capability of being able to address these challenges in a dynamic manner. And as a consequence, they do what global institutions are good at. They form committees. And they have preliminary committees to prepare the agendas for the committees. Did, did you hear that G20 discussion this morning? It was absolutely charming. The logic for keeping the G20 finance ministers is to prepare the agenda for the G20 summit. And the logic for having the vice ministers is so that you can have more people preparing in appropriate ways. And that's why you need the Sherpas as well. So you create an institutional structure to serve a dysfunctional instrument, because no one in his right mind or her right mind believes that the G20 is currently a successful operational framework. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to the G20. I'm merely suggesting what our natural institutional response is under these particular circumstances. That's how we end up with 158 international, 158,000 international agreements. This isn't the way forward. It's not the solution in terms of the challenge. So what is it? Danny Roderick has come up with an interesting idea, and so I'm mentioning it preeminently because it swims against the current tide in respect of this. He came up with a proposition that we had created scale in the context of globalization, which he calls hyperglobalization, which he argues is fundamentally destructive of democratic accountability at the nation state level, and therefore argues that we need to step back significantly in most areas of hyperglobalization, as he calls it, in the economic realm. He doesn't argue that in areas associated with a tragedy of the commons, climate, potentially pandemic, those sorts of areas. He doesn't argue that in those sorts of spaces, we can manage anything at the national level. But he says that the, we have created dysfunctional processes by moving beyond the tolerable limits of what we can manage. And this is a thought worth thinking about. I, I'm not advocating it at this moment, but it's a thought seriously worth thinking about because we have certainly exceeded our capacity to be able to address these challenges in a substantive way. I'm going to close now, Stuart, but I, I want to go via your last two questions. 
It doesn't seem to me that in the aftermath of what we have seen around the occurrences that have caused a considerable degree of concern and in some circles shock within the newly re-emerging powers preeminently uh, in the BRICS space, but preeminently in Asia. It doesn't seem to me that against the backdrop of the misjudgments made in the expansion of the space vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and the resultant tensions with our, in the whole space between the Gulf and Central Asia, uh, around what was generally perceived in much of the developing world with shock that the US was not able to manage Katrina effectively in its own backyard. And most importantly, the sense that somehow Wall Street was responsible for the global financial crisis. Now, I'm deliberately casting each one of those statements in a perceptual mode, not an analytical mode, because I'm describing at the moment how I think people are reacting to these particular phenomena. This doesn't suggest that there is any great enthusiasm for the adoption of the existing normative frameworks that have been developed out of the Western paradigm over the course of the past 30 years. That means that I think these paradigms, the paradigms of global governance, are going to be challenged. I think they are increasingly being challenged on an intellectual level and on a philosophical level. We haven't reached the point outside of the G20 itself and outside of the dispute between China and the United States around Remembi revaluation and the uh, acid bubble effects of QE2, the second round of quantitative easing, we haven't moved to a point yet where there has been significant confrontation in respect of the preferred paradigms in this area, but I think that it is unlikely, there is certainly no evidence of the sort of deferential respect that you would have taken for granted 15 years ago in discussions around these particular issues. Uh, and in that sense, Kishore's somewhat triumphalist luncheon address is reflective to a very appreciable degree of a rising sense of self-confidence within the Asian spaces and I would argue within other emerging market spaces. Even Africans from highly unsuccessful countries today are becoming much more outspoken about what they perceive to be the weaknesses of the Western model, the inadequacies of the West, the moral failings of the West, and a whole series of other things. This suggests an emotional tide premised in part on misrepresentation or misperception of reality and in part on appropriate perception of reality. But it doesn't seem to me that any assumption premised on the forward projection of the existing normative paradigms that we have relied on for the past 30 years out for the next 30 years is a plausible paradigm in respect to the future. Where is leadership going to come from? I don't think it's going to come out of the process that we have at the moment. I think that the process we have at the moment is likely to take us to the brink of disaster. And I'm not saying that in order to provoke doom and gloom. The simple truth is the only time at which the G20 functioned really effectively was in April of 2009 just after, or four months after, the collapse of, of Lehman Brothers. At that point in time, with the entire financial system of the world about to crumble around us, the G20 were able to stand together with their backs against the wall and, in fact, agree on a common position. If you have a look at what was represented in the most elegant manner possible to us by Jean David in terms of what came out of the, the uh, EU Council meeting, uh, you have a very similar uh, circumstance in respect of it. When you get to crisis, people are usually able to subordinate uh, their immediate concerns and reach a high degree of agreement. The difficulty is that if it isn't normatively anchored and isn't related to the achievement of measurable, tangible advantages, it doesn't last beyond the point at which the crisis is perceived. So the core question, it seems to me, is that we are going to face one of two alternatives. We're either going to hit the wall, and it's going to be a much bigger bang than the one that we've had already, and it'll probably be some combination of financial and social disturbance, 
associated in all likelihood with some inflection points in respect of what one can think of as planetary boundaries. So the limitations that we have in climate, uh, ocean acidification, uh, fresh water, fresh water ecosystems, uh, biogeochemical loading, the whole of the stuff that goes on around us while we humans pursue enthusiastically our endeavors. Any one of those could cause a major surprise and could cause a major realignment in terms of our thinking. Think the Second World War, think 1815 in this city, uh, think uh, the attempts made uh, at Versailles in the aftermath of the First World War. There have been plenty of cases. Think uh, the period leading up to 1979 in China after the disasters wreaked uh, by uh, the, um, the 12 years prior to that. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that we develop a much greater sense of humility, stop imagining that we know all of the answers, stop imagining that we can go back to business as usual, start developing an appropriate sense, one of scale, learn to think across disciplinary boundaries and become much more respectful of the different value sets and normative systems that major actors in the global space pursue, hold to, but do not necessarily have the opportunity of contributing meaningfully to the debate. Thank you very much um, for that um, very provocative um, presentation. Um,